Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow, and this is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire, Episode 39, Vladimir the Great, Part 4, Building Rus. So, let's conclude the story of Vladimir. Vladimir was enlightened, and his sons and all the country with him, says the tale, seemingly not disturbed at all that none of these sons involved his Byzantine princess wife. The chronicler says that he had twelve sons, and he assigned them to various towns, having obviously not learned anything from his own experience. Vyshislav got Novgorod, Izyaslav Polotsk, Sviatopolk Turov, and Yaroslav got Rostov. Vyshislav died young, and Novgorod passed to Yaroslav. Boris got Rostov, Gleb, Murom, Svetoslav, Derova, Evolod, Vladimir, and Mstislav Tmutorokan. Vladimir is concerned by the sparse population around Kiev, so he establishes forts on the surrounding river network and begins moving Slavs, Krovichians, Chus, and Vietichians into the forts. They fought with the Pechenegs and, according to the tale, often overcame them. Of course, Vladimir continued with his church building. He brought artisans from Greece to build a church dedicated to the Holy Virgin and then appointed Anastasius of Kherson to be its priest. He established the city of Belgorod and moved people from elsewhere to populate it. Vladimir went to war with the Croats, and on the way back he finds the Pechenegs drawn up at the river to face him. The prince of the Pechenegs proposes that their champions will meet in single combat, and that if the Rus champion wins, they will have three years of peace. But if the Pechenegs champion wins, there will be three years of war. Vladimir goes back to his camp and sends out his heralds to find a champion, but no one volunteers. The next day, the Pechenegs turn up with their champion, and Vladimir is concerned that he's going to look the fool. An old man from his host approaches him and says that his youngest son, whom he had left to look after the home, is prodigiously strong and has never been beaten. Vladimir summons him, and when he arrives, the youth offers to fight a bull for a demonstration. The youth then, according to the tale, literally rips the skin off the bull. Vladimir takes this to be proof of his qualifications to fight. The next day at dawn, the two champions come out. The Pechenegg is a giant, and the Pechenegs laugh at the moderately sized Rus. They start to fight, and the Rus champion crushes the Pechenegg in his arms and throws him to the ground. The Pechenegs run away, and Vladimir founds the city of Periaslavl to celebrate. On his return to Kiev, Vladimir finds his new church complete and pledges a tithe of his property to it. He fights the Pechenegs again, that three-year deal obviously didn't hold up, but loses. He escapes by hiding under a bridge and builds another church there to commemorate his survival. Upon returning to Kiev, he's impressed to see that the people had taken to Christianity. He throws a feast and gives food and drink to the poor, even sending wagons loaded with food to go to the sick and needy who were unable to come to the palace. Vladimir lives in peace, which leads to a proliferation of robbers. His bishops teach him that it's not violence that's a sin, but unjust violence. Punishing robbers is righteous. So Vladimir abolishes the war guild and introduces a law to punish brigands. The bishops propose using the proceeds of this law enforcement to fund his armies. And there is plenty of war for them, the chronicler tells us. Almost constant attacks by the Pechenegs. Vladimir tries to raise troops in Novgorod, but while he is away, the Pechenegs attack Belgorod. The people of Belgorod are suffering near starvation under the Pecheneg siege. 
They have no hope that Vladimir can relieve them in time and consider surrendering rather than starving to death. An old man tells the gathered city elders not to surrender for three days. Instead, he collects some grains from them and some honey from the prince's store. He orders two pits dug and places tubs in the bottom. He uses the grains to make porridge in one and pours water sweetened with honey into the other. The next day they summon the Pechenegs. Thinking the townspeople want to surrender, the happy Pechenegs come into Belgorod. Instead of surrendering, the townspeople laugh at them, telling them that they have an endless supply of sustenance just coming out of the ground, and they can easily last for another ten years. Just look, they say, drawing up some porridge from the pit in the ground, eating and offering some to the Pechenegs. The amazed Pechenegs lose hope of victory and abandon the siege. A series of deaths follows. Grognet, Yaroslav's mother, Izyaslav, the son of Vladimir, Sieslav, the son of Izyaslav, and in 1011, Anna, the wife of Vladimir. Her death being the only thing she did in her whole life since marrying Vladimir that the chroniclers found worth mentioning. Up in Novgorod, Yaroslav has been paying 2,000 hryvni a year to his father in Kiev, and 1,000 to the garrison in Novgorod. But now he stops paying. Vladimir immediately orders, repair the roads and build bridges. He was just as ready to go to war with his son as with anyone else. So, in 1015, Vladimir gathered his forces and Yaroslav sent messengers to Scandinavia to recruit Varangians. But God will not give the devil any satisfaction, the tale says, somewhat cryptically. Vladimir falls ill, Boris is with him. As the Pechenegs are attacking again, Vladimir sends Boris to fight them. On July 15th, Vladimir dies. His men keep his death a secret, wrapping his body in a rug and carrying it away to the Church of the Virgin that Vladimir had built. When the people heard of this, they assembled to mourn him, the tale says. The boyars as the defender of their country, the poor as their protector and benefactor. They placed him in a marble coffin and buried him. The tale's concluding words on Vladimir are too long for me to quote in full, running to a couple of pages, so I'll just quote a few extracts. He is the new Constantine of mighty Rome, who baptized himself and his subjects. For the prince of Rus imitated the acts of Constantine himself. Even if he had previously committed other crimes in ignorance, he subsequently distinguished himself in repentance and almsgiving. Vladimir died in the Orthodox faith. He effaced his sins by repentance and by almsgiving, which is better than all things else. It is indeed marvellous what benefits Vladimir conferred upon the land of Rus by its conversion. But we, though Christians, do not render him honour in proportion to this benefaction. For if he had not converted us, we should now be prey to the crafts of the devil, even as our ancestors perished. When a righteous man dies, his hope is not lost. The people of Rus, mindful of their holy baptism, hold this prince in pious memory and glorify God in prayers and hymns and psalms, singing to God as his new people, enlightened by his Holy Spirit, maintaining the hope of our great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, that he will give each of us joy ineffable according to his labours and such may be the lot of all Christians. End quote. And so concludes the life of Vladimir the Great. I think it's fair to say that the chronicler knows there is one thing and one thing only that makes Vladimir great. But almost two decades from the baptism of Rus to his death gives us enough time to see if he was capable of doing anything else significant. 
As you will have noted, there's an awful lot of war fighting going on for a second. We've previously noted some of the drawbacks to Kiev's position, and Vladimir adds in another, the lack of people in the near vicinity. Indeed, the archaeological record seems to bear out the city lacking a hinterland, a concentration of population in smaller towns and villages around it, farmers and artisans, people to serve in the military. This had been part of what motivated Sviatoslav to look at moving his capital to a more populated area further south. But instead, Vladimir would embark on an enormous building program. He began moving people around in order to create new settlements and strongholds. From grave goods, we can tell that the tale is correct to say that he moved a variety of Slavs and Finno-Ugrians. The graves also show us a progress in the spread of Christianity. Pagan grave goods gradually begin disappearing, although it takes a long time for them to drop out completely. Cremations begin to be replaced with coffin burials. After all, Christians needed to keep their body for resurrection. He begins to work on the Zmievi Valley, the snake rampart or serpent's wall. If you cast your mind all the way back to the Scythian and their dragon banners, that's where the name comes from, and the walls were a response to the steppe nomads. An extensive network of earthwork defences was built out towards the steppe south and west of Kiev. The ramparts linked rivers used for transportation with fortifications built at prominent points, and included a continuous rampart running all the way along the left bank of the Dnieper. A large settlement was built where the Sula joined the Dnieper, along with the ramparts running along them. It included a fortified harbour for boats sailing on the Dnieper and covered a total of 27 hectares. You can tell its purpose from its name, Voin, military or warrior, or, as we might say in a more modern English, the base. The ramparts blocked routes towards Kiev lying between the rivers, and the new forts reinforced Rus' points of control. The inner forts were permanently manned, while the forts on the outer walls would be used as needed. The episode where Vladimir loses a battle and hides under a bridge took place at one of these outer defences. The ramparts are mostly intended to be an obstruction rather than an impassable wall. Outside of manned areas, the earthworks were only three to four metres high, usually with a wide ditch in front of them. They were built in series, sometimes six deep, creating terrain that could not be crossed at any speed by a mounted army. The forts also marked a, another stage in the Rus' own transition to a cavalry-based army, with large stables built at forts to enable mounted troops to swiftly move from one place to another. The artisans that Vladimir imported to help build churches introduced new building techniques that were also used in constructing these defences. While the ramparts were mostly the traditional log-reinforced earth structures, the forts used wooden framing and unfired bricks as supports enabling them to reach as high as 8 metres. The brick-making techniques were introduced by the Byzantines, using dried rather than fired clay, similar to the technique that other Byzantine artisans had already introduced to Volga Bulgaria. Even though the tale essentially glosses over all this construction work, the impact was significant. Settlements around the forts began farming the territory. The archaeological record clearly shows that the region around Kiev went from barely settled to well populated within a couple of decades. Under Sviatoslav, the Pechenegs had been laying siege to Kiev itself, raiding deep into Rus territory and were a constant threat to Rus merchants on the waterway south. Under Vladimir, the missionary Bruno of Kerfurt described the realm as, quote, everywhere enclosed. When he departed on his attempt to 
vandalize the Pechenegs. It took him two days' travel from Kiev to reach the gate in the walls where he left the kingdom of Rus, and another day beyond that to finally find some Pechenegs. Although Vladimir is still involved in near-constant warfare with the steppe, his heartland is no longer under threat. Rather, the story of the Pechenegs' failed siege of Belgorod, one of the largest of the fortified settlements in the defensive system, shows that it's successfully performing its function of keeping the Pechenegs out of Rus. The new towns also formed a bulwark of Christianity. Their cemeteries show no sign of pagan practices, with bodies in coffins placed in graves without barrows raised over them. Another advantage for Vladimir was that these were his towns and villages where he ruled without question. Unlike Novgorod, where the people had demanded their own knyaz, these people were his. They provided a resource of wealth and manpower within easy reach of his capital, reducing his dependency on, in particular, mercenaries from further afield. This also affected Vladimir's own standing. While Sviatoslav had presented himself as one of the warriors, the leader of his retinue, Bruno of Kurfurt found Vladimir to be a ruler clearly set apart from and lording it over anyone else in his realm. Bruno gives us some other interesting tidbits. He had travelled to Rus from the Germans to convert the Pechenegs and started by visiting Kiev. This might seem a bit strange, given how we are used to thinking of the Orthodox and Latin churches being in opposition, but it's another piece of evidence that maybe the division was not that strong at the time, and we should not project it back. The Pope had actually sent two missions to Vladimir since he converted, one of them including envoys from the kings of Hungary and Bohemia. On one of them, the Archbishopric of Gniezno, had been established in Poland. It was supposed to cover Sklavinia, an area that included all of the Slavic peoples. Part of Otto's plan for the Holy Roman Empire was for it to mimic the ethnic territories of Rome or Byzantium, so he designated various parts of his empire as Germania, Gallia, Roma and Sklavinia. Meanwhile, the Hungarians had aligned themselves with Rome, so perhaps Kiev's attachment to Constantinople was not yet set in stone, and the envoys were bidding to bring Rus over to the Germans or the Pope as part of these processes. Vladimir also sent out his own envoys to Rome shortly after, with the stated purpose of observing the land and customs as well as other missions which he sent to Jerusalem, Egypt, and Babylon. Their actual destinations could well have been the other patriarchs, in Rome, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Antioch. And rather than seeking an alliance with any one of them in particular, they could have been gathering knowledge for the Church of Rus to increase its independence. Anyway. Bruno had travelled to Kiev, where Vladimir tried to put him off going to the Pechenegs by saying that he would be killed. Bruno thought Vladimir was a good Christian king, and despite what Patriarch Kirill thinks, he didn't seem to see anything in Orthodox Rus that made them separate from German or Latin Christians. Bruno also describes a clear boundary between the territory of the Rus and the Pechenegs and the assumption among both that war was the natural state of their relations, which, if you recall previous episodes, is a shift away from their ability to find a common cause. Despite Rus writers describing the Pechenegs as savages attacking without provocation, this was not quite a one-way street. The construction of walls is not only defensive, it's also offensive. By building Rus defences out into the steppe, Vladimir was not only protecting his people, he was also asserting that land that was not previously belonged to the Rus 
was now his property. For the peoples of the steppe, as we shall see again in the future, this meant that their sedentary neighbours were settling in river valleys that the nomads might previously have used as winter campsites, and converting summer grazing into farmland. Predatory steppe raids did not just come out of nowhere. The structured system of defence against the Pechenegs, which required vast amounts of manpower to build and maintain, as well as to man the defences, gave Vladimir a large-scale state project that displayed his leadership, but was also in the interests of his people, and therefore legitimised his rule. For now, this defending the people against foreign incursions was the key role of the King of Rus. A ruler's legitimacy is also established through the giving of laws, the imposition of order, and the use of royal authority to resolve disputes. The tale's references to the robbers and brigands oppressing the Rus, and how it shows that the bishops had to get involved before Vladimir would do something about it, indicates that Vladimir had not yet taken on that king as lawgiver role. This aspect of state building had not yet arrived in Rus, although we will not have to wait too much longer for it. Vladimir extended his authority to the more outlying areas and existing cities through the use of his sons. Twelve are mentioned, which does not seem a huge amount for a man with 800 concubines, although none were from his Byzantine princess Anna. Possibly he had more, and he only picked the most promising and competent for these roles. The young men were assigned to strategically important cities. Novgorod, of course, Rostov and Murom in the east, where the border with Volga Bulgaria was, Urov, which had been independent, in the west to Vladimir in Volinia, modern-day Volodymyr in northwestern Ukraine, in the Chervin lands that he had conquered, as well as to the Derevlians, who we can see were still maintaining a separate identity within Rus. Vladimir's marriage to Anna and the adoption of Christianity had certainly put Rus on the dynastic marriage map. Vladimir's eldest son, Sviatopolk, who may actually have been the adopted son of Yaropolk, the brother that Vladimir had killed on the way to the throne, was married to the daughter of Boyeslav Robry of Poland, whose name the chroniclers did not find worth recording. Unfortunately, this attempt to build relations with Rus' western neighbour did not go as well as planned. As was the usual practice, the Polish princess brought her personal priest with her. The priest, Reinburn, found that there were still plenty of pagan Rus around, and he did a bit of proselytizing. This might have included converting Skatapolk to a Latin Christian under the name of Peter. Historians are forced to speculate because there's no record of what actually happened. But Vladimir accused Svetopolk of joining a Polish plot against him and threw him and his whole family, in, along with Reinberg, into prison, where the priest died. Despite the tale telling us that Vladimir lived in peace with his neighbours, this actually resulted in Boleslav using the incident as a pretext for a brief invasion of Rus and attempts to use the Pechenegs against Vladimir. Along with what happened to Sviatopolk, this whole episode, which is covered in the Polish and German chronicles, is entirely missing from the Rus records, which suggests that it could have been deliberately removed for some reason that we do not understand. And as we'll see in the next episode, although Vladimir appears to have successfully repelled the Poles in 1013, Boleslav is not done with Sviatopolk. An attempt to marry one of his sons by Rogneda, Sjavolod, to Princess Sigrid of Sweden was even less successful. 
According to the sagas, she had him and another suitor killed to discourage other candidates from bothering her. Vladimir also asserted his status by becoming the first Rus ruler to issue his own coins. The rulers of Volga Bulgaria had beaten the Rus to this milestone, but as a result of the collapse of the silver trade from the Caliphate, they stopped minting their own coins at just around the same time that Vladimir started his. Vladimir minted gold and silver coins based on Byzantine models. The scale was probably not enormous. Only a handful of his gold coins and a few hundred silver have been found. Due to the silver shortage, the silver coins contain more copper. The coins are interesting for how they portray Vladimir. On the early coins, there is a Christ Pantocrata on the face, like Byzantine coins. Vladimir is depicted on the reverse, on a throne, wearing a Byzantine crown and holding a scepter with a cross. This was a bit of a local innovation. The throne was the main attribute of authority for the Slavs, a tradition that came from Scandinavia, rather than something that they had copied from the Byzantines, which displayed the head of the emperor on their coins. To make sure you got the point, the coins were inscribed Vladimir Nastoli, or Vladimir on the throne. On later coins, Vladimir on his throne moved to the face of the coin, and the reverse displayed Vladimir's personal sigil, a symbol of ownership or authority that the Rus had adopted from the Tamgas used by the Khazars and other steppe peoples. You would probably recognize it, as today it has become the trident emblem of modern Ukraine. We've encountered rulers of Rus called the Seer and the Brave, not titles that require much analysis. But when a king is called the Great, it naturally provokes the question of, was he? From the chronicler's viewpoint, we don't have to wonder what he thinks about Vladimir. For him, the baptism of Rus makes Vladimir one of the great figures of world history, a man of destiny who forever decided the history of Rus. But as we discussed in the last episode, that Vladimir is one that has little to do with the actual historical Vladimir. For the actual Vladimir, the baptism of Rus was probably just another way to pursue the same aims that the rulers of Rus had been pursuing from the beginning. Legitimacy, prestige, territory, and trade rights. Vladimir can also lay claim to greatness in his consolidation of Rus. The assertion and reinforcement of borders, massive building programs that involved shifting whole populations around his realm, founding cities and bringing Byzantine artisans to Kiev to introduce new technologies and instruction methods. Franklin and Shepard compare him to another great, Alfred of England, who carried out a similar construction campaign to create the network of bergs to defend England against Scandinavian invaders. Vladimir's building program was bigger than Alfred's, who did not have the advantage of being able to move populations wherever he needed them. The newly populated hinterland of Kiev contributed to Vladimir elevating his role as ruler into someone truly separate and superior to all the other notables of Rus, a shift that was embodied in his coinage, the churches, and new stone or brick-built banqueting halls where he was literally elevated above everyone else. Vladimir also reinforced his power by distributing food and drink to his people. The tale claims this was aimed at the sick and needy, but since it also notes that it included large amounts of alcohol, it was probably more generally targeted than that. 
The extension of control along the key waterways protected shipping from the steppe raiders who had made the trade along the Dnieper so dangerous since the first Rus ventured along it. Trade with Constantinople boomed, especially the slave trade, which also stimulated the Rus to range further to the north and east in search of non-Christian people to enslave. The transferred populations were separated from their traditions and communities and forced to adopt new ones. For leadership, they were focused on Kiev. For religion, they were orthodox. Although the tale tells us that Vladimir moved all kinds of people, Chud, Ves, Mordova, it also gives the clear impression that they merged into an identity that was dominated by the Slavs. Some tribal names start to drop out of the chronicle. The Polyanians are already gone by the time of Sviatoslav, subsumed into the Rus identity. The Radimichians and Severians start to disappear around now, although the Vyachians and the Slovenians around Novgorod will still be around for a while. The Hiplochi argue strongly for the emergence of a Slavic-centered Rus identity, as we move into the 11th century. And these populations that Vladimir transferred to the Dnieper would have bolstered and formed a core part of that. We'll be looking more at Rus identity, who and where it came to include, and as a result, how it relates to later Ukrainians, Russians and Belarusians in the upcoming episodes. Vladimir's achievements in consolidating and uniting Rus and building his authority clearly put him at a level above any of his predecessors. But on the other hand, he did not take part in the administration of justice or right laws, a key aspect of creating successful long-term institutions. While he may have accelerated the formation of a Slavic Rus identity around Kiev, the Vyatichians and other peoples that had been brought under Rus rule still maintained separate identities. They may even have strengthened them in reaction to the spread of Christianity and other centralizing measures. At least, graves show increasing amounts of goods specific to particular ethnic groups over the next couple of generations, and the records show that sometimes travelers from Kiev needed to take care crossing the territory of, say, the Vyatichi. To reach other Rus cities. Certainly, the adoption of Christianity was not the only decision he made that had major, long lasting consequences for Rus and its successors. But that word successors brings us to his main failure. Just as the sons of Sviatoslav had gone to war as soon as their father was dead to decide which of them was to rule, Vladimir was to leave his kingdom to the same fate. He died in 1015, preparing to go to war against his own son whom he had put in charge of Novgorod, which to me has to be a major blot on anyone's claim to greatness, and that is only the beginning of the succession struggle. Recall that the tale tells us about 12 of his sons that he appointed to various cities. By the time this is over, there will be only one. Join me next episode to hear what the Vladimirovichi, the sons of Vladimir, do once their father is gone. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. (laughs)